Hey, my name is Kevin Rusik, and welcome to SAP Tech Bytes. Today, I'm going to show you how we can consume the Advocate service through an AppGava trial instance. So let's get started. So what is AppGiver? AppGiver is a low-code, no-code platform designed and developed for citizen developers in mind. This toolkit, the AppGiver Compose Pro, helps you as a citizen developer to develop cross-platform applications without or barely writing any code at all. With the um, Composer Pro, you can drag and drop your app together and use uh, logic pieces which are predefined to enhance your app's capabilities and features. If you want to have a little bit more complex um, features in there and functionality, you might need to write smaller JavaScript snippets or build the logic uh, pieces yourself. So to get a better idea of what App, uh, Composer Pro is, what AppGiver is and how it works, we wanna take the uh, advocate service I've introduced um, last week and uh, build an app, simple AppGiver app on top of that service. So uh before that uh, before we jump into compose pro let's take a quick look at the service itself um we've learned we got a rest endpoint here um, for the advocate service and we're going to consume the members endpoint and in the members endpoint we've got all the sap developer advocates in there we got um rich in there dj myself vitaly thomas josh marius um and um we're going to consume exactly that data and build UI on top of that with Composer Pro. So I've opened up Composer Pro right here. And uh, basically you can just sign up, it's a trial, and uh, then you can create your own applications. So let's just do this. So we say create new, and then give the whole thing a, na a name. So we can just say, this is going to be um, my Advocates app. And we can select a theme and we just leave the default and say create. So now it's setting up our workspace. And with Composer Pro, we can then simply create variables, data endpoints, and our complete user experience in here. So let's take a look at that. First of all, we want to make sure we have the data in uh, the data endpoint defined so we can actually consume the data and uh, display that in a proper user experience. So we click on the data tab up there and we can see there is no data resource added yet. So we can just say add data resource. And here we have different options. We have client-side storage, REST API direct integration and marketplace. So marketplace here just allows you to search other components, um, the AppGyver, uh, the, the AppGyver team build, or people from the community build. We don't need that right now. The client-side storage itself is, as it says, a client-side storage data endpoint um, where you can write your data into a local database and read it out of there. But what we wanna do is we actually wanna consume um, a REST API. So we say REST API direct integration, and then here, it wants an ID, and we just say this is um, um, the advocate service, and it wants a description, uh, the service of the developer advocates, and it wants a resource URL. And for that, we just grab this URL here, and just throw this in, we remove the top 11, we don't need that. And we're not going to take the members here into that resource URL because we just want to define the base URL. And with that, we've defined the advocate service base uh, settings here. And we can just say save. And then we got over here on the left-hand side, we got get collection, get record, create record, update record, delete record. And um, in the trial here, we only can define one. So that's why we're uh, using the members. But if we say get collection, we see this is our base URL already in here. And then here we can just simply say slash members. 
and we could put like a response key path in there. We could put HTTP enter headers and all the other stuff uh, we might need for more complex use cases. But in this case, we don't have authentication. Um, there's nothing special we have to add to that request. So we can just add our members here and test um, the endpoint. So we just say run test and we get um, our JSON uh, response back with our advocates in here. So the next part would be to actually go in and set that response as our schema, because that allows us to go in here and uh, take the attributes AppGyver automatically detects and uh, change them if we needed to. So right here, it recognized that ID is a UID, so that's okay. Created at is date time. Created by is an email, this, this is okay too. Description, first name, focus area, last name, all text, that's great. Modified at, at this point, um, is any value um, because it couldn't recognize it properly. So here we can just say modified at is also, um, let me see the date time, right? So we just select that and change that here. So you can see it changed over here. The modified by, we just want to match um, the same th uh, also to email address like the created by. So we select it, go in value type, and then say email address. And then title is text again, so that's okay. And let's save that. All right, so we got our data endpoint defined. We got our schema set. So now we can go in and actually work with that. So let's just close um, this and go back to the UI Composer Pro um, designer. So let me just quickly walk you through what you see here. So up here, you can see the device um, which is getting displayed. So we have like all the iPhones, we got an iPod, iPads, Android phones, we got web um, here. And then you could also define custom if you want to, for example, build an app for TV OS um, or something like that. But here we just leave that on, on iPhone XR and uh, go over here to the left-hand side. So here we got the core library of UI elements. We've got some basic elements like icons, titles, paragraphs, images, and so on. We got forms or form elements like a drop down field, input field, password field. We got layout. So sometimes you want to build your own layout, and we were going to do this in our example as well. And we have uh, list elements. Another cool thing is you also have the component market. And in the component market, if you open that, you see there's like far more controls in there you can um, actually install and use in your app. Let's just take this one here. This is like a Google chart thing. And um, we can just say install. And then you see in the installed folder that this thing is installed right there. And we can use it and just drag it over our UI. But first, uh, but we don't need that uh, Google chart element. Um, we need different or just the basics uh, in this case. Um, so let us just get started and um, go ahead and implement the main screen for the Advocates app. So here, the headline itself is just um, just a static title with, with a label. So here, you select that, you see we selected the headline. And um, down here, you see the page layout. So the UI tree, and here we see the title. And um, you can go here in and actually um, rename that as well um, from title one to, to something else if you wanted to. Um, but here, we just go in and say, these are the developer advocates. And uh, um, we've got a paragraph here, which we don't want because I'm just going to list all the advocates and list items. So we go ahead and remove this. And now I want to have like a, like a nice um, table view cell, if you know iOS or just like a, like a list item in there. And um, I've looked through 
the existing list items here. And as the advocates have a relatively large focus area title, which I want to display, these items here don't resize the labels properly um, in a way that I can display a lot of text. Uh, so these are uh, built for a little bit smaller informa uh, text information. So what I want to do is I want to build my own um, list item, which in this case would be a row. So I can just drag that row in here. And you see that row comes with two containers. And in here, I can place um, different UI elements. And also over here in that tree layout, we've got row one with our cells in here. So let's just um, put another component from the component market in here. And uh, there is one which I've looked up beforehand. And this is this one here, static text field. This is exactly what, what I want. So I just drag that over here in that left-hand um, cell here. And now I have a label and static text content. And this is going to be the name of the advocate. And this is going to be the focus area the advocate is working on. And then, of course, we have a chef run on the right-hand side, usually, if we have a list item, at least on the iOS platform we got. So I want to put in an icon here. Now you see the icon gets placed up there. So we got to do some layouting. Um, so we want to go in and first of all, change the icon. So we just click, let me just go back. So we select the icon, we click here on the right hand side, and now we've got the icon library. And here we can look for Chevron and just select that. And we got the Chevron here. So now we want to have that whole thing on the right and positioned in the middle. So what we got to do is we're going to go in here and we we select um, the cell two, and then under style, you can change the layout of um, of the, the element you've selected, right? So here we want to say um, we got that cell layout uh, position center, and on the right hand side. Next part would be to actually increase the, the available space for our labels. So I select the cell two, and then here on the right-hand side, I can increase the cell width. So what I'm gonna do is I just go in and just increase that in a way I'm happy to. So we say our text has space to expand all the way um, here to the right. So this is just saying cell with eight and with none then. Cool, so basically our cell is now done. And um, this is here in this row. This is, this is containing out of two cells with a static text field and an icon, our chevron. Now we go back to the properties tab because we wanna make sure that this cell here gets repeated as many times as we have advocates. But how do we know this? We just define the endpoint. For that, we have, can switch or toggle between view and variables. So here, I just toggle to variables and we see a whole new screen opens up. And here on the left-hand side, I got app variables, page variables, page parameters, data uh, variables, and translation variables. So app var variables are variables which are known in the whole app. So you define them once, and uh, you can access them from within all the pages. The pages are the views in AppGuide. Then we have the page variables. These are only visible and known to the page you're defining them on. Then the page parameters. This is important if you do navigation and you wanna pass information from one, from one screen to the other. So you're using the page parameters for that. And the data variables is actually what we want. Data variables are like page variables um, but their schema is defined by the data source itself. So here we can say we want to add a data variable from the ad, based on the advocate service. And here on the right hand side, we want to say this is a collection of data records because this is going to be a list of advocates. And here we just say these are our advocates. And then we save. So this is basically just returning an array of advocates. 
So we go back to our view and then select our row on the right hand side. And then we got here something called repeat with. And repeat with, you can feed an array to, and it's going to replicate that cell as many times as that array has items. So we go in here and then we can say, repeat with data and variables, data variable, and then the advocates. And we've already seen list of objects with 10 properties. So this is actually what we want. And we just say safe. And it's going to preview us um, that it gets replicated or repeated with our information here. Um, and it shows that in the, in the UI itself. So the next part would be to populate data. And that I can do here on the right hand side with the tree and I select my static text field. And in my properties here, I can say this label. So the first label here is supposed to be not label. I can put static text in here, like Kevin, and you see this is getting um, reflected here in the UI. But what I wanna do is I wanna actually put the first name and the last name together. And for that, I'm using a formula. So formulas are a way to dynamically build up um, the data for like a label here. So here you can say my formula is of type current and current describes the currently selected data entry of my list. So you could imagine that it's looking in your list. It has 10 items, 10 advocates in that list. And then it starts repeating, building the UI for each of these items. And uh, current describes the currently relevant data entry. So here we say current first name. And you see, I got my attributes from my service right here, first name. And if we look at the service itself, we got that here as well. First name, last name. So we say current first name, and then we want an empty string in between because we want some space. And then we say current last name. And we see the example results are actually being reflected out of our data source. So we see Rich Hyman, DJ Adams, Thomas Young, and so on. And it says our expression result type text is valid. So that's good. So we say save, and we see the, pre the preview value. You can you could just leave that, and then it would say Rich Hyman and all of them. Or we just get rid of this, and you see um, that it's actually being reflected by a formula. This next thing would be the content. And the content is a little bit easier because we just want to display the focus area here, right? So SAP ABAP and HANA development or SAP integration suite and things like that. So here we can just basically say data. Um, and that's not what I wanted. We've got to say property of data item in repeat. So that's actually doing the same thing as um, using the formula with current. So here it's just um, an abstraction for you, um, but this is actually just taking the current and then whatever you see selected repeat current, whatever uh, data property you want to use. And here in this case, we want to do focus area. So it's basically if you would do a formula current dot uh, focus area, it's basically doing the same thing. And we see the preview value being in here again. We can just remove that if you want to see the attributes rather than an example in here. And that's all we got to do. So basically our first um, view or screen is almost done. What I want to like to do is maybe your advocates team is a little bit bigger than ours. Maybe it has a hundred advocates and then it might say it makes sense to have um, a search field or a search bar in there. So we go in and we just got a search bar um, element here we can use and we just drag that in here. And we've got the search. And that search, we now got to put some search log uh, logic behind, right? So what we do is we say we want to go back to the variables. And we want to create a page variable, which is going to re represent the search input the user types in. So we say add page variable, variable one, and just change that to the advocates 
search input. That's just what we call it. And it's going to be a text. And we don't need an example value. And we just say save. Now we go back to our view. Select our search bar. And then in value, we can just say we want to use a data or variable. And we see the page variable is recognized. So we say we want to have the advocate search input. So every time a user types in something into the search field, it gets automatically written in that page variable advocate search input. Now we kind of we could change the placeholder text to, for example, search advocate here. And it's going to be reflected in the UI when we run that later on. So now, how does the search logic itself works? The search logic itself here works in a way where we can say we want to filter the list of items according to whatever the user put in here. And my search logic is going to be, you can search the advocate by name or by focus area. So what we want to do is we want to select that here. I want to make sure we select that row, not only the field. And then in the advanced properties, you got visible true. And that means that UI element is visible at this point, always, if there's data. So what we want to do is we want to change that visible logic here and say formula, and then go away from just saying true and actually um, change this to um, something different to the actual logic of um, of the visibility so here you see the formula screen and you've got a bunch of function libraries here so we got bitwise we got color stuff we got date where you can manipulate date engineering, financial, to do some financial calculations, list, math, and so on. So what we're going to use is just saying contains. And we have to here with the documentation. So contains, check if a text contains a slice of text, returns true if the given text contains the given slice of text, otherwise returns false. And that's what we want, right? So we say contains, and then lowercase because we want to make sure that all the input fields are lowercase or the all the input uh, is lowercase and you can you can kind of feel like this is really no code but it's still code a little bit i mean you still got to understand how bro programming works at least in a really basic way i mean for us full-fledged developers who develop in programming languages like Swift or JavaScript and so on, things like contains and lowercase are well known, right? But for someone who might have never developed anything or just bar uh, barely developed stuff and, and is not really sufficient in programming languages, we got this great um, library of predefined methods they can use with a nice description and examples. So they can just click all the logic together and with a little bit of practice i think um simpler logic pieces like this are possible um, without a problem so here we say lowercase and then again we want to go to the current and then say first name because we want to filter on first name and on last name as well because we want to respect the whole name of the advocate and we want to also say against what the contains goes so here we say lowercase the full name contains and then we want to say lowercase our search text so we can say page bars so accessing the page variables and then here we got the got the um auto completion already with the advocate search input and we also want to check the same thing um, for the title or the focus area itself. So we can do an or and then just say contains lowercase 
um, current focus area. And here we want to go in and say, oops, lower, lower case and the page arrivals again, and then the advocates search input. So let's just quickly check what this is complaining about. Oh, the contains is missing. And this is our logic here um, for the search. And we just say safe, and the preview value can stay on true and just say save. And this is our first um, view and it's already done. So how do we um, actually see our result um, live? And for that, we have a companion app coming with AppGyver. You can download the AppGyver app in the App Store and then from there, over cloud share, you can open um, your app at any time. So let's just do this real quick. So I got uh, QuickTime opened up and my iPhone connected to my MacBook and I've opened up the AppDiver app. And here we can see all my apps being in here and um, we wanna open our My Advocates app. So let's open this up. And here we see the whole UI being reflected in our app. And we can try out um, the things we've implemented. We can try out the search, for example. And here we can just uh, search for Italy and we can see this works. We can also search for the focus area, like, I don't know, I'm interested in ABAP development. So I'm punching in ABAP and we see, oh, Rich is the expert on ABAP. The next part, which would be interesting to us, is actually doing navigation because right now I can tap on these um, list entries, but we don't get any navigation here and we want to fix this. So let's go back to AppGyver Composer Pro. And in here, we select this row because we want to perform a navigation on tap of that row. And uh, down here we can say show logic for row one and we open that up and you see we have events here and we have core logic um, components we can use like open the page navigate back set different types of variables opening dialogues like a toast an alert or confirmation showing spinners um, manipulating data getting data records updating deleting them um, actually also accessing device capabilities like scanning QR barcodes, taking pictures or reading the GPS location. And advanced, and we're not going to cover this today, but JavaScript. So we could actually write our own logic blocks in JavaScript and include that in our logic flow here. So the way this component or this logic flow works is as you see with that these components. So we got an event component tab, and that's actually what we want. And then we will drag in the open page because after somebody tapped on that row, we want to perform a navigation. So we can simply drag in that open page and connect these here by just simply clicking and dragging. And here, open page on the right side, it wants to know which page it has to open. It also wants to know if this new opening or this new navigation is going to be um, modal or not. In our case, it's not going to be modal because it's a detailed screen. So we just leave that on false. And here it wants that page. We don't have that page yet. So we have to save before we make changes here to the page editor. So we save that and then up here, we can say add new page. And that page is going to be the advocate detail page or advocate detail. So we create that and we see it open up that new advocate detail. Before we go back and set the advocate detail, 
we want to go open the variables um, page for that advocate detail view. So in here, we want to say page par uh, par parameter because we have to uh, tell the, uh, the software that it needs a page parameter before it can actually initiate that page. And the parameter here would be the advocate's ID. So we can go in and uh, create that, um, that parameter. So here, say add parameter, and we call this advocate ID, and this is going to be a UUID. And we say save. Now going back to our first page, and let's just rename that from empty page to the advocates list. Here we can now say, selecting our row, opening our logic view, open page, select that. And then here we can say, it should navigate to the advocates detail and save. And now the Composer Pro already knows it requires a parameter. So it wants the advocate ID. So here we just give it the advocate ID. Again, property of data item and repeat, current, and it all already recognizes how oh, the parameter isn't UUID. The only property on current, which is a UUID, is ID in that case. So we select that and save. And that's it. Now our navigation should work. So we save and open up our um, companion app again. So we see the screen refreshed. We also have the advocates list title up here now, and we can perform navigation to the detail and navigate back. So right now it's just showing that dummy data in here. So we wanna make sure it's showing the right data. And for that, we go to the advocates detail and uh, in here we can make the changes uh, we need. We've got to define a new data variable. Data variables are page dependent. So here we want to say we have a single data record, which is the advocate by ID, single data record. And uh, we can leave this field free because we are going to set that dynamically. So we say save, go back to the view. And in here for the page, we got um, also a logic flow. So not only for each and every single UI component in there, but also for the page itself, itself we got a logic flow. And here we wanna say, if I receive a specific event, and that specific event, and you can select it over here in the event source, is that the uh, um, the the page got focused. So that means that the UI should should be loaded. And I just remember, I still need the advocates list. So I just create another data variable, advocates. And of course I could create that as app variable in that case, but here I just say, this is my advocates, say save, go back. And then I can actually not say page focused. I could say receive event, and then we wanna do data advocates change. That means that the data got loaded. Um, from the backend. So data advocates changed is my event. And if that event happens, I want to do set a data variable, which is my advocate by ID. And let's connect that, select a set data variable. Here it automatically recognizes that the advocate by ID is not a set data um, value yet. 
so that's proposing me to use this and then in the data field itself i can actually put the logic in which will populate that data um that data field with my custom object so i go in here again navigate back and want to use formula and my formula is find by key find by key is find an object in a list by a key so i want to go take the list data advocates i want to map or check get the object by id so i pass in my advocate id this is my page parameter so params and just say save and with that i make made sure that the advocate by id data field is filled with the current selected advocate and now i can operate or build up my ui um, with that um, data variable so again headline i want to have first name and last name so we just do this here with a formula and here we can say add data advocate by id first name and last name save save again and now um, i want to put in some additional information so i use that another two title pass them in here of course i don't want them to be as big as the main title where the name is i want to actually style that so i change the typography and we're changing the font size to 20 maybe and also change the text color to like a slight gray maybe something like this and this one here do the same thing typography change the font size to 20 and the color here in that case is going to be the nice um sap blue and i've written that down uh, here so let's just steal that hex value and put that in and uh, we got the colors we changed the font size now we gotta kind of change the arrangement because this is having way too much um space to the top so we can say the dimension and position is going to be um is going to be uh less than eight so we say uh let's see minus eight that looks good and here we might want to do the same thing minus eight actually go higher minus 16. yeah that looks that looks better um and now we can populate the data again and say here we want to um show the title in that case so data variable advocate by id and again we have all the properties here so we, i can just say simply select the title say safe and here we want to just display the focus area again so do the same thing and say focus area safe and here i just want to show the description of the advocate so i can leave that paragraph in here and instead of just showing some static text i say data variable advocate by id and i got my description and safe and uh, this is basically my advocates detail view so i saved that and let's just check it out how our app looks like i got the app giver and i got my advocates app and this is loading again we got the search search for thomas this time okay cool we're into, uh, interested in sap btp integration extension so navigate to thomas young and we see thomas young head of developer advocacy sap btp integration extension and his description text so we navigate back try this out with somebody else maybe with myself kevin music sap btp cross architecture go in and we can see the, the data being reflected in here as well and with that you can build up um, your app in a really basic way um, you can do minor um, changes to the layout and to the style 
of certain things like the colors and, and so on. You can build your own controls like I did here with the with the row. And you can simply put together logic pieces um, to build up your app flow and app logic. And of course, there's way more to do and way more possibilities with the uh, Composer Pro to build apps. But this should just give you a basic introduction on how you can consume with a REST API, which is coming from a cap service um, in AppGyver and uh, actually consume the data and build a nice basic UI on top of that. Before I let you go, the thing is, if we look at the data here, first of all, it has to follow um, a certain response type. So it always has to be an array on the uh, as the outers most outer object, and then just having objects in there. So basically, an array of objects. So that's what AppGyver expects us um, to deliver from the REST endpoint. And also what it wants, it wants cores being enabled, right? So um, here in our advocate service, we got cores enabled um, being whitelisted for everything right now. So if we look into the code real quick of the service itself, um, we got the uh, server.json, and I've showed you that last time as well. In the bootstrapping, I'm saying I need course, and every request and response and everything, we want to set the header to access control low origin, and then star. And this is I'm just because I'm doing testing, but of course, you would want it to just whitelist the AppGyver um, domain, so the uh, Composer Pro um, can actually interact with your um, service properly and fetch that data um, in, and um, then you're good to go. And uh, if you want more information about that, you can read the, the, the blog post coming together with this TechBytes video. Wowzer, we did quite some work today. Uh, building an app with the AppGyver uh, Composer Pro is not that hard as long as the app is basic, displaying data, um, updating, deleting, editing data. Those kind of things are really simple to implement with the AppGyver. Even a bit more complex logic flows are relatively easy uh, to put together with the formulas and the logic pieces you can just put together. The documentation inside of AppGyver is really nice, I gotta say. And what I didn't show you is that AppGyver even has an in-IDE tutorial system, uh, which is super cool as well. And um, I would say, if you wanna build a, a cross-compiled application in a really simple and fast way, AppGyver is a great tool for that. And um, with that, I want to leave it uh, with the AppGyver. And next time for the next TechBytes video, we're going to look at how to build the exact same uh, UI with Swift UI combined with the SAP BTP SDK for iOS. And with that, I want to say thank you for watching and see you next time.